Hello, welcome back to Endless Runner uh, tutorial over here. Uh, my internet broke, so hopefully um, this is going to work right now and uh, does not have any issues over here uh, anymore at least. Uh, so uh, let's hope this is not going to break down at any point. We are going to continue in one moment. Just want to see if everything works here on my side. So, where did we left off? Well, we wanted to make sure that we create a link cache over here and put this to the scene. And um, um, so we're going to be able to um, check if we are moving into a wall or even not. So, for that, we are going to fill the link cache with a link cache L with hip L. And then we can do some kind of a layer check. This layer check could be any layer mask, for example. So we should define that. Public layer mask. And then we can say something like a wall layer. And we can define this wall layer over here inside our physics check wall layer. We only want to check whatever is inside this wall layer so it's easier for us to define the actual um, to define the actual layers is easier because uh, we can continue um, continuously uh, otherwise would we'll check ourselves probably and we want to avoid that we want to use ourselves just for a collision with obstacles so we're gonna do the same thing over here so meaning we need to do two checks the first one is once again the R or right one and the other one is going to be the left one. So we got this one and we're going to use hit R over here. So we have two hits, the L hit, the R hit and the left ray as well as the right ray. If we are hitting something, so uh, we want to check that of course as well. If hit L dot collider if that is going to hit something, we can compare or tag for a hat uh, for a, a specific tag if we want to. So if we are hitting a tagged wall, but also if we hit something or anything, that should be a good option here as well. So if we hit something, so if we hit find a collider inside this wall layer, we should return something like false because we found a collider which is going to be um, uh, part of the wall layer. If that doesn't work, we can once again also tag these things. Same for the right side, the right ray over here. We want to check for a collider if that is the case, then we return false. And since that here, this bool does not return uh, co all code passes, we need to go outside of that. At the very end, if we pass those two tags, we want to return true, so our uh, actual movement is going to be okay over there. With that bull check over here, we should be able to say, meanwhile we hold down the actual key end, we have a valid move possibility. So end, valid move, we have a valid move, then we want to do the transformation. Don't forget to save and let's go back into the script. Each tile later on is going to be a prefab or a, pre uh, uh, yeah, a prefab so we can uh, create them constantly. But now I want to check for these two walls here, these two cubes. I want to make them part of a wall layer. And the wall layer can be literally anything. I could just name it walls. And I want to tag these two cubes to be inside the walls layer. So whenever we find these two cubes with our ray casts, then we should not be able to move further. Let's see if that works. I hold down my left mouse key. But anyhow, it doesn't work. Because instead of returning false, I need to return true here at the very end. I believe I said this, but I didn't typed it. 
So let's try again. So at first uh, we know that the valid move check works because when it returns false the player does not move at all. But it does not seem to react to any of these wall colliders here. So the question now is why is that happening and is the railings probably the wrong side or maybe it's not correct. To check this, we can draw rays on the screen so we see if they actually get checked and created correctly over there. How do we do this? Oh, wait, probably that is the issue. I need to go with hit R here, not hit L. I don't think so, but um, uh, otherwise the L should be uh, triggered anyways. Um, maybe it's not the correct walls we are checking here, but let's see. So these two, oops, these two are part of wall layer, which is cool. Let's take a look. Where is our cube object, which is going to be this one. And we don't have uh, this one here. We don't have this mesh render component enabled. Maybe the length of the rays is not long enough. Maybe we have to make them longer, but I don't think so, but that would be a possibility. Let's draw these rays to see if we are at the correct spot. So we can say something like uh, debug dot draw ray. We want to draw a ray. So, and the ray is going to be ray L dot origin, not direction, dot origin comma ray l comma ray l dot um, dot direction and don't forget to save i believe we should be able to color tint this as well yep color dot red so we can see this one better uh it needs to be big color c and save that we can do by the way we can do the same thing copy we can do the same for the for the right for the right um, origin or for the right ray, but I would go with a color blue instead, so we can see a difference and can see where they shoot at. I go out of maximize on play, so I can see directly in the scene where my rays are going to shoot. Actually, I don't see any because, well, we need to move. There we go. There was a there was a ray shooting. So the red one is looking to the left, and the right one is looking to the right, which is okay, which is correct. Now what we need to do is uh, we need to figure out why this here. Is not triggering. So the 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 uh, the check could here be probably um, could not trigger because we are not using a tag. So maybe this just checking for a pure collider. Maybe this does not trigger at all over here um, and returns false at this point. So in that case, we can uh, use a tag system here as well. So we can say compare tag and just try that. We want to compare the tag wall with it. We're going to do the same thing at the bottom. Actually, that's a sad option, but uh, this one was yesterday uh, working. Control S for quick save. Now we need to make them walls here, giving them a tag as well. So we give them, we create a new tag, wall, was it a big W? That's how I named it. Now click them again and make them a wall tag. 
So we have a wall slayer and a wall tag. And let's see if that works better. This doesn't work either. That's interesting. Let's make them trigger and try again. They don't really care. So what could be the issue? Why do they not? Oh, I know why. We forgot to give the player to check uh, which layer to check, actually. So the walls layer should be this one. And we should be able, um, that's what I want to try here. We, we should be able to check for any type of collider he's going to hit. I just do this for, no, let me do this for both, just in case. So uh, I just command this uh, wall tag stuff out because maybe we don't need this tag. I want to know that, so that's why I try that out. Gonna press play again. And now we stop. So the issue now would be, how do we get this one back? Because, well, whenever I click and I try to move my my player to the left back again, I cannot move because it returns forth and tells me, hey, you are not allowed to do this. So we need to find a way to figure out or we need to figure out how we get rid of this false one. And I believe there are possible uh, some possibilities, like pushing it back automatically would be one option. So we put back or push back until uh, we are uh, not uh, hitting the wall anymore. So we literally move it into the opposite way until we are not hitting it anymore. That would be an option just to drag the player or push the player away from the wall. Maybe there's another way we can do this. Uh, let's think about it. Once again, guys, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And uh, sum this video up if you like it, as well as, um, yeah, ask questions in the chat if you feel you could help or you want to say just hi, here I am. So feel free to do that as well at any time. And you can also, uh, yeah, write down commands if you want to in the command section down below. So what could be our issue? How could we get rid of this Valmove thing to avoid being stuck in the wall? So putting it or pushing it away could be one option. So we literally push, if, if we have not a valid move that we push away from the wall, no matter where we, no matter where we are dragging our character to. What would be another way? We could store values. Um, so instead of saying here, if the valid move is possible, maybe we should not do this overall to not allow the input, but maybe we should say um, we don't allow left-sided or even right-sided input depending on that. So we literally take this and I'm gonna drag it out or just cut it out and let's put it here and see what it does. Don't forget to save. Let the compiler run. And uh, see if we can uh, get away from the wall to the left when we are stuck into the right side. So currently we are stuck in the right. So that means we cannot move to the left. And this brings us uh, to the next to the next issue here. So we can do the move uh, valid move check, but both do the same thing. Both are doing the same check. So probably we need to split it apart. 
so we are allowed to move to the left when we um, do have mouse click input position. So we don't check both at the same time. Maybe we need to split it into two functions. So we do uh, actually try um, valid left move and valid right move in total. So I split this complete function into two. Maybe that helps. So this one here would be a valid right move. So we get rid of the left transform and the left uh, ray debug line. And we get rid of the left raycast check as well as the raycast hit, which we don't need here as well. So it's a more simpler way now. We can, it's easier to read. This is not needed as we already knew. And we need to clean up this one. Since that one is a right move, this is the left move. We get rid of everything about the right side over here. So we don't draw the debug line. We don't need to hit R. And we get rid of the right check. So probably spitty litting them up makes them more useful. So in here we want to use, since we go left move, we want to check for valid left move. If we drag, if the mouse position is smaller than our click position, and we do the same over here for the right side. Let's see if that makes any difference. We'll see. Don't forget to save and let's get back. Let the compiler run, press play and see if we can do this right now. So I go to the right and as you have seen, there was only the blue ray. If I now move to the left, I can do the same. So it depends always on now on the direction where the develop move is going to be, but do it through splitting them apart. They do literally they do the same thing, but in another way in a, and they do this separately based on the input. We're going to we're going to give it over here wherever our mouse first mouse click is corresponding to the um, position to the left and to the right based on the direction actually. Nice. Let's save the scene. Next one, I want to do a bit more. I want to do a rotation over Y axis whenever we uh, uh, do left and right. So that means when we do, uh, for example, we do this uh, left sided input, we want to rotate the, or I want to do this, want to rotate the character a bit to the uh, actual, its own right. Uh, its own right side, um, like when, when it looks to us, it's going to be its uh, right side. But based on that cube, we're going to do a, yeah, we do a right side um, a rotation up until a specific point. Um, so we don't want to overdo it. Something like 15 or 20 um, degree angle, I would say. So how could we do this? Well, I have no idea. So we need to check this out. Um, we want to transform the rotation of the character. What we could do is we could increase the rotation amount by whatever number. Plus equals something, but we need to make sure that we don't overdo it. So maybe we can do something like quaternion.rotation or rotate towards. Rotate towards sounds good. Or maybe we're going to do a from to rotation over using a vector. And if we release, I want to, that's another thing. If I release, I want to do a from to rotation as well. So probably we're going to use from to rotation or a rotate towards. We could use a rotate look rotation but that doesn't make sense uh, we could look to the mouse but I don't think that I want to do this and then here we got a from two uh, based on a quaternion um, we can define a maximum degree angle and over here we got a forward and a upwards vector boy no that's the wrong one the from two is going to give us a starting vector as well as a 
uh, to uh, like a direction vector. I don't know. Let's try that. Let's try from to rotation. From where we want to rotate. It's a vector. It's again we want to use transform dot rotation. I oh, know transform the position literally. Hmm, that doesn't really make sense. Since rotation is a uh, quaternion, we might need to do something something different over here. I'm gonna do a small break and we will be back in a moment. So let's take a look into the documentation over from to rotation over here. That is, um, if we do a rotation over a quaternion, um, it says when we use a from to rotation that it, creta uh, uh, it creates a rotation which rotates from the from direction to the to direction. So the to direction, the direction could be literally any vector. So vector three dot up is going to be the from one and towards um, or to the transform dot forward uh, is going to be probably not the correct one. So what we could do is we could also check the other ones like we could uh, use a slurp or a rotate towards a point, rotate towards uh, whatever, an ankle maybe or towards, yeah, towards what? Towards the target rotation. And so from our current rotation to a wanted rotation. This one could be also a, a Eula ankle, literally. So a quaternion dot Eula as uh, representing a vector on the y-axis. Let's try using rotate towards. So we use that rotate towards a point or towards from transform our current rotation to with a comma and that's going to be the two that does not work well, then we choose a different one. We need to uh, end the line with a semicolon. It's a bit long over here. I'm going to go over that in just a second once again. So what we do is transform rotation is equal to quaternion rotate towards. That's meanwhile we hold down. 
towards the quaternion Euler in here, I would say a negative 15. So we buy rotation speed and time dot delta time. Let's see if that works. I have no idea. So with a speed of 2, we rotate towards a rotation over the y-axis. Meanwhile, yeah, meanwhile, we hold down the key. So I press play and see what's going on. Actually, I don't see any rotation happening. So I go and check this once again. Inside update, speed times delta time to delta time. So it could be now the problem that there is not the correct target rotation. Or the speed is too small, which could be a possibility here as well. Let's use 50. Because it hasn't moved at all, it seems. And press play and see what's going on. So, as you can see now, it is going to do its job. And we are not able to leave the screen still. Now I want to do it so that, meanwhile, this is going to happen. Whenever I let go, that I go back into the center. Like we rotate backwards. I hope everything is back again. So yeah, my internet is currently make such issues but today it seems everything is going to be uh, pretty tough on my side so i what i want to implement right now is and hopefully my stream is going to stay online today or for now on is i want to go and make it so that whenever i release uh, the button or meanwhile I don't do any input that I am rotating my character back and I was trying to do it like directly after these inputs over here inside the update loop by just uh, setting the Eula angle to be zero that doesn't work so what I want to do is I want to use a, an extra boolean for this to prevent input so that means I'm gonna name this something like uh, moving um, or we could also name it is moving so when I press down and I store a click position I want to set moving is equal to true I want to do the same thing if I release the left mouse key but I want to make it so so on mouse button up I don't need the click position over here because it has been stored beforehand. But I want to deactivate as moving to be false. Now we can use this, this moving to use the transform over here. So if I'm not moving, so I need to negate it by an, uh, the uh, exclamation mark, I want to go and translate my rotation back to the center by the speed of I currently have a rotation speed of 20 don't forget to save and let's test this out once again so if I go left and right it's going to rotate over here which is okay for the moment and for the current speed but if I let go you can see it's going to rotate back to the center pretty good so now we got this one running here as well we just need to play around later on with the speed of these things 
like with the speed of a rotation and the movement speed. For example, movement speed maybe needs to be a bit faster to be more reliable in with the actual rotation over here. So it maybe looks a bit better. If I press play now with 2020, it maybe looks better when the speed is faster. And if I let go, the rotation does rotate back to the center. I believe the rotation speed has to be faster. So maybe the 50 or something like that was not too shabby at all. And maybe the movement speed on 10 could be good here as well. So I try again. Looks cool so far. It's not as speedy as it probably could be, but that's okay. That's fine. Nice. Now we need to go and instantiate some pieces. Um, so we have this constant running uh, actual game and then we can go with the flags and stuff like that. So when we hit the left flag, when we hit the right flag and then we are on a good track over here. To do so, we first off need to get rid of all these things and need to prepare one tile which is actually repeating itself every now and then. Or I believe we are going to go for a bit bigger pieces. So, first off, I get rid of all the tiles we cur I currently have but one. And I'm going to put this under, under my guy over here once again. What I want to achieve is that, first off, I want to make it so that there are no, no gaps within these tiles. What I try to at least. No gaps to the left and no gaps to the right. So I scale this one maybe a bit more. And the question is now, uh, where do I need to put this? This is actually not the correct one. The Z is okay. The X one is not necessary for us. Now what should be the scale? Probably scale uh, not on Y, but the scale on that might be 10. Because uh, it's 10 times, since it is 1 meter in size, a usual size, we need to say 10 times this one. Same on the other side. So I reset Z value. X doesn't matter. And here Z needs to be 10 as well. And the rest is, is okay. If I now would go and use this tile and scale this over the z-axis by 2, they should follow up. So we have a bigger tile, which is okay. And also it makes us more, uh, or gives us more time and more space on these tiles. So what we can do now is we can now duplicate this um, at least once and put some things on top of it. Like, um, as I said before, like um, those little flags which are showing or pointing into one or the other direction. And so we can prepare multiple things. By the way, we could also automate that. We can say, hey, use this range um, wherever you put these flags. But the downside on this is we need to make or have make sure that we got enough space for this driver or for our player to pass by these flags depending on, of course, this, the collider size um, at the bottom of our character. So we cannot directly scale it, but we can uh, manipulate later on the pivot point, well, not the pivot, but the actual um, collider itself, if necessary. So we can make it smaller if we don't have enough space to pass through specific areas, for example. So, how could we make a flag? Well, we could use an uh, empty game object first. I'm gonna name this one flag. And we can uh, reset this one to be a uh, zero, zero, zero. Now on this flag, 
I want to have a, a cylinder, so 3D object cylinder, and I want to make it slim, like 0.1 in in uh, X and Z, and height could be somewhere like two or three. I don't know. Now I want to lift it up by half. So whenever we use or put this flag anywhere, we're gonna be able to see this one um, exactly where it is. So lift it up by two should be the correct one. So we now have a flag on the field. Of course, it's hard to see at the moment, so we're gonna tint it. Um, maybe we're gonna make this one a black piece. And then what I wanna do is I wanna create a box as being the flag showing to the left or to the right. To the right. So I create a new 3D object cube. And then I uh, flatten this one. Maybe make it a bit broader. And I can decide if it is a right flag or a left flag. And so I can put this, let's say, here. And for example, if that is green, then we can see this. And then we can create another flag, Control D, duplicate. Gonna put it here. And make this a right flag, just dragging it over. Uh, make this one maybe blue or red or whatever. Super simple. So next one is we wanna, s we wanna know if we have passed the flags. So we have multiple possibilities to do so. If we pass this one, but it is going to be, well, if it is here, as w uh, y ever, um, then we need a long range to check. We need a long space to check the complete playfield size, literally like 20 meters. We need to do this. And the best or uh, well, the easiest way is we just give it another collider object which is able to check this for us. And also a script is going to sit on this object later on to check this. So it's literally like a feeler, like um, like an antenna. We could, once again, we could, could also use a raycast, but we can also use just a simple cube um, or a cylinder or anything else. To do this, we can say, hey, this one here, is going to be our good one and we also have another side we want to make sure that the other side gets a, a negative number or negative something if we now scale this one here over 10 in the actual x value here that's 10 times longer and if we do it 20 times then we have like the full size over here what we also probably want to do is we want to slim them down on uh, the y and z value to 0.1 and 0.1. We want to keep it small. Uh, we want to make it so that it is like wherever the player's um, collider height is, this box collider needs to collide with one of these things. So this is important. So this is my, let's say, positive feeler. And we need a negative feeler as well on to the other side so we can see if this feeler um, if, if this feeler touches or if, if you as a player touch this one then you get positive score and the other one would give us a negative score so we control D duplicate this uh, feeler control D and bring this over to the other side you can leave a little gap here, shouldn't shouldn't matter too much. But each of them feelers, there are some uh, probably some issues, and these issues might be the in between over here. Like whenever we touch these this or that one, we should always go for the negative one probably. But that is something we need to test out later on. So in here we're going to put a negative feeler. Who just checks if you gone uh, have gone through that uh, over on the wrong side, literally. I'm going to tint it red and this one here green. because um, So it's easier to see for us, at least for the moment. 
We're going to do the same for the green flag. I copy them and make them child of the green flag. And then I move them together. So they're fitting the green flag over here. So if we now move the green flag away a bit, we can see that this one is now the negative and this one is the positive. So they need to be opposite. So I'm going to bring this one to this side. And the positive has to be on the other side. Something like that. Now we can also create a gate, like a gate where the player can or has to go through. So both of these uh, left and right sides would be negative areas and the, the rest would be positive area. So I control D this flag and create a new side over here. We make it a bit bigger maybe. And we can also um, scale around here a bit just to make it a bit different here. We can uh, give it anything else, any other color. We can also give it an orange one. And this gate only has a positive feeler here. I'm gonna go and um, scale this one up. But also at the other, uh, in the other hand, it has a secondary negative feeler over there. Sadly, I cannot go uh, close to it or close enough to it. So if it touches negative, negative is maybe a caused later or requested or touched later. I don't know yet. So now we have three types of flags um, which we can make use of. In this, we can place them literally wherever we want to. We can define, let's uh, say, something like from the center. It can be maximum to the left and to the right automatically per tile. Uh, so we can do a decision um, per tile, but they always have to be at one specific, let's say, height, as an example, like from from the left side um, or the right side, that's okay, but we say the Z value or the Z position has to be on a specific one. So what we want to do now is we want to instantiate those flags on a, a newly created tile so we can constantly create new tiles at a one specific position. And the specific position is going to be somewhere outside screen, literally outside of the boundary of the, of the camera. And also we want them tiles to move into the Z direction with a different speed so we can see what's going on with them. And we want to destroy them or object pull them as I already talked about in the last video, in the first one, uh, at a specific position. That could be possible as well. But maybe the leading is easier, so we just get rid of it, we create a new one. Of course, code-wise, it probably is better to just um, pull them, um, and so we don't have to re-instantiate new parts. But that doesn't really matter at all, I would say. So what we want to do now is we want to create a tile um, a script which is actually doing the movement as well as on instantiation creates one flag or out of a pool of these three flags at the moment um, so we can get score and uh, the score stuff is going to be handled later on a bit different um, so we need to create uh, prefabs for all these uh, three flag pieces so we can instantiate them directly when a tile gets instantiated and so on gonna make a small break and then we go and continue Okay, so what we want to do is we want to first off create a new folder and I call that scripts because everything about scripts might land inside. And also we create a new script. We let the compiler run for a second. 
uh, create a new script and we can name this tile or we can also name this whatever uh, but that is a wrong naming convention gonna delete this pretty quick and uh, create a new one right click create c sharp script hopefully without tile typos now and now we can open this one in Mono Develop or Visual Studio. So I open tile script. And in here I want to constantly move the tile forward. And I want to instantiate on start. Well, that's what we should keep the start function for. On start, I want to uh, create a new flag on a uh, specific um, position away from the start or from the pivot point of the tile from the transform to position. So how do we do this? Well, first off, we can define that position by a vector um, like a vector three. So something like a vector three star, um, actually that's a spawn point the spawn point for the flags and we can define this by new vector 3 and then it's uh, something like we need to negate from the current position over a z value so we say something like a z value minus 9f for example so we say 0 0 comma 9 but in here uh, we can keep we can keep this one as a positive number since we want to spawn, well, uh, we, we say plus, when we add this, we can also say it's a negative number. Um, what we also need is a list or an array of game objects. So public game object array of uh, flags we can spawn. So you can you name this one flags or flag list. Uh, even if it's not a list, it's an array, but literally it's the same. And since it's static, it always uses the same pool of flags to instantiate that. So, and at start, we can do um, a decision making uh, um, stuff. So, which flag to spawn and where to spawn it. So, what we need to define is the minimum and the maximum values of x. Since over x, we want to limit that that x value between a minimum and a maximum value over x. So to spawn that, I create a new function since we do need some uh, some for loop and stuff like that. So I name this one spawn flag. Open close curly brace. And for spawning a flag, we want to instantiate the, the flag first and then we want to position it. So we can say something like instantiate open close parentheses first off which one do we want to instantiate and to randomize the pick which one to instantiate we want to say uh, we create a integer uh, of flag index we can name this whatever we want the flag index is just the index and inside the area which just represents a zero one or two and uh, what we can now can do is we can say random dot range between element zero and the maximum flag list amount. So flag list dot length. If it would be a list, then we would use a flag list dot count. Now we want to instantiate the for, from the flag list the randomized found flag index inside this flag list. Now we can position that one. So we want to randomize the position between uh, an x value. In that case, we use a float. And we say we want to have a random x value. So I name this just ran x or random. Random x is equal to random dot range between two values. The smallest value should probably not be lower than 8. And then biggest one should be not higher than eight. We always look from the transforms position of the board. The Z value again is going to be part of the spawn point. So the spawn point 
is going to be random x but spawn point here over z. So we can manipulate spawn point by overriding it with random x over here. Or um, we don't need the spawn point as a vector over here, which probably makes a bit more sense. So instead I'm gonna use a float uh, and I name this one spawn spawn z which is going to be the negative value over here. I don't need this parenthesis. So I define this by negative 9. Now we want to create a new vector here then. We fill in all data. On x we want to have random x. On y we want to use a 0. On z we want to use spawn z. Hopefully that makes sense. Now the next one is quaternion dot identity. We want to spawn this in its initial rotation. And now in start we want to say spawn flag. We want a new created spawned flag. Oh there's one more thing. We want to make it so that this uh, this newly created flag is child is child of our current object. Um, so we need to define this object, this newly created flag, being part of this, um, uh, yeah, of this tile. So what we need to do is we need to catch the object first and name this one something like a new flag. So we instantiate this first, and now we do say new flag dot set parent, but it's inside transform dot set parent. We want to set the parent of the new flag to be this dot transform or just transform. Don't forget to save. So otherwise, if we now move this one here, meanwhile we move it upwards in the Z or forward actually. Meanwhile, we we don't want this one to slip away. Let's see if that works. Oh, we can. We we should also define let's say uh, later on it so that we don't have multiple of these running or maybe the first ones are not the first ones are not spawning this one so we have an let's say we we got an option or we will have an option uh, so the first three or, or four tiles do not count um, so we can set them up by hand or literally on our own if we want to so now what we want to do is we want to translate our our uh, tile upwards so we say we want to transform position plus equal and now we, we want to add this transformation over that in that case we can use vector 3 dot forward or actually the transform dot forward should be should work here as well so transform dot forward times now we need a speed value float speed is equal to, I don't know, whatever the speed could be, 4 times speed times time dot delta time. There are a bunch of possibilities. We could also say something like translate. Now we can also check if transform transform dot position dot z is bigger, let's uh, say uh, 20. We want to destroy the tile, so we can say destroy, destroy game object. Don't forget to save, and let's see if that works. Before we can test it, we need to fill in the data for for this this tile. So first of all, I put this on on top of the tile, and in the flag list we need to create all the prefabs for that flags. So I create a new folder for the prefabs and drag all my flags inside. So this is my uh, through flag. This is the actual right flag. Naming convention is king. Don't forget this. And this should be the left flag. So we later on see this easier. 
So, and now, with renaming done, I drag them inside the prefabs folder. So, left flag, right flag, and the through flag. And now we can get rid of these, since we don't need them anymore in the scene, at least not for the moment. But on the tile, we want to drag them now all inside flag list, so it, they can be picked. If you have more flags or multiple other things, you can put them here as well. Since we can also put objects like a tree or a, like bad habit objects like a snowman, we can put the, all these things directly inside. So now let's test if this tile here creates a flag and moves upwards. Pretty good. And after it is outside of the way, I want to see that in the camera. I want to recheck this. Once it is outside of the camera, maybe I gonna uh, bring this up a bit more. I want to create a new one um, as well as uh, I, I delete this and so we don't care about the rest. Also the 8 is probably a good number. Well not for the big ones so we need to uh, define this maybe to be smallest probably a 7 so it's easier to go left and right. Let's try a 7. That's okay. Let's try again. That's okay as well. Let's try again. That's cool. 7 seems to be a good number. I hope, I guess. Because we need the space for the player to pass through on the to the left and to the right side to see as well. Looks good. Now what we want to do is we want to have a spawner which is taking care of t uh, spawning new tiles every now and then. And for doing so, we can do something like if that one has been erased, we're going to create a new one at another position. And so we can trigger that spawner at any time. To do that, we can create a new empty game object. We just name this one. Uh, yeah, we, Literally, it could be the game manager for us. Also in scripts, we want to create a new c -sharp script and call this one Game Manager. Once the compiler is done, we want to drag the Game Manager on top of the actual Game Manager object and create a spawner for our tiles. Double click to open and Mono Developer Visual Studio. Once it has been loaded, we're going to be able to put in all these things and we can define where and how we want to create all these things. So every time one gets deleted, we want to create a new one. We don't have to do this in update. Update is not necessary. Well, literally, we don't even need a start, at least, not, at least not for the moment. So what we need is we need to know um, the tile game object to spawn. Tile prefab and we need a function which is actually doing the instantiation method at the correct position. So currently we are deleting the tile over onto negative 20 when all moving the same speed and whenever we reach that point we need to spawn at the correct position as well. Uh, probably there could la be lags which are uh, yeah, not following um, the correct rule, meaning maybe it can be a gap in between them two tiles or more. So that is something we need to take care of. So the spawn position of our tile, that's what we can define already. It's going to be a new vector. So we name the spawn pos is equal to new vector3 
I'm close parentheses, x is 0, y is 0, but z is going to be something like negative 60. We, since my tile is 20 big, like 20, 20, 20, um, especially 20 over uh, z value in this case, I want to make sure that when I'm at, uh, when my character is at, uh, at zero position, so negative 20, or plus 20, then 0, then negative 20, negative 40, negative 60. And that's where we want to start at. Now we need to create a public uh, method to call the instantiation method. So something like create, create new tile. Again, this could happen that they are lagging or this is lagging away and probably gives some gaps. So maybe we're going to need to create an unrounded number. What we want to do is we want to instantiate a new tile prefab at position spawn POS with rotation quaternion identity. And that's literally everything we need to do. The tile just needs to call the game managers function to create a new tile. To have full access to it, we're going to create a singleton. So we say public static game manager and give it the name instance. And then void awake. We say instance is equal to this. So we define the singleton by that. So we only have one instance of game manager in C. Now we can call create new tile if it is public from any other point in the game. In that case, every time we destroy a game object because our transform position dot z of the current tile is negative twenty or is is a plus twenty, we can say game manager dot instance dot create tile. Um, close parentheses, close the line with a semicolon and save the script. So let's see if that literally would work. If I know it wouldn't have more than just one tile and this tile gets destroyed, it shouldn't work. It should give us a unassigned reference exception. So um, the game manager does not know what a tile is. So we need to create a prefab for the tile. And we now need to make sure that the game manager knows about this. So we drag it in here. Also, script-wise, we got an issue. We need to delete or destroy the game object after we were creating another tile. Otherwise, it gets ignored and we don't spawn anything. What we also could do, we could duplicate multiple of these tiles and bring them onto correct positions. I don't know, that should be negative 40. That one here should be negative 20, since they are 20 long. And the next one would be negative 60. So we need to have one more, actually. As you can see here. So at negative 60, we're going to create a new one once another one reaches the top over there. Currently, that is rather small, but you will get the idea. Also, we see another issue. And the issue is the spawning on the tiles flags. Because currently, we are using a fixed vector over here. But we do not implement the actual um, game object so in that case, random x is fine, but spawn z is wrong. Spawn that should be transform dot position plus the actual spawn z value. And in here, not spawn, uh, not that, but um, yeah, transform dot position dot z value based on the object. So we are creating this in object space or let's say away from the each of the individual tiles. Let's see if that works. There we go. 
So each of the tiles has its own flags. And every time a tile over here uh, reaches the minus 20, we create a new one. And this one creates a new tile for us. So far, so good. So now we should be able to um, navigate through these things. We can go a bit left and right. Currently, it's a bit, you know, slow. But we should be able to to pass these areas. This one here is the one where we need to go to. And here we have enough space to go to the right. And pretty nice. So next one is we want to increase or I want to increase the speed of the tile. Since I don't think that is really appealing. Let's make it 10 for for fun purpose. So 10 is a bit better. So we now can try to, whoa, that would be a negative points. But that looks pretty good. And also should we should be able to, to beat this uh, literally and to get some score and points whenever we pass these green lines. That was or is a rather close one. That's one too. So 10 seems to be cool depending on the speed. Uh, our mouse is going to give us the hardest one are probably these ones where I need to go by or go through so probably not too easy to to get through uh, there's an issue my tile prefab lost its information about the tag or not the tag but um, the actual walls for forgot about their layer we need to pass in here the walls layer for the tile. Why do I do this directly in the prefab? Because the prefab is like a template and each of them tiles now should also know about walls layer, as you can see. That's why we do changes always um, directly inside the prefabs. So there are some issues. So we can say something like, or what we should do, we should do is we should change the creation of flags in the first four tiles but for the moment that looks pretty good and we should not be able to go outside let's try here yep we cannot go outside um, of the play field this is absolutely good so yeah the next one is just a go get score whenever we pass by and deactivate all the feeler objects so we can only get one thing so when we collide with a green one we deactivate green and uh, red so we are okay with it and vice versa if we uh, hit the red one first but not the the green one or something like that um, that we only get one kind of score a negative score or we lose a life or something like that and to do that, we need to um, create a flag script, which is literally taking care of that stuff. So each feeler needs to understand that. So whenever something hits the feeler, in this case, the, the actual um, player, then we just need to tell the feeler, hey, you're good or you're bad. And then we need to deactivate all the corresponding feeler so we don't get double points or something like that, or uh, probably lose a life when we are not passing by uh, the green but the red area or we are too slow going down and so on also for the tile i want to do put a boolean which is uh, just for the first ones which makes it so that we are not allowed when this boolean is false i don't store the information i don't store the information inside the the, the prefab the prefab always uh, should spawn something but um we want to make sure make uh, give ourselves an option to deactivate the tile um, creation for this first, let's say, two or three f tiles to not have a flag. And to do so, again, we use a bool can spawn flag, and this one needs to be public. And literally, we need to set this one to be equal to true at the very beginning, like so. And we can only spawn a flag if that is true. 
So in spawn flag, we're going to do this at start, which is okay, but only if that is true. So in that case, we can do something like if, oh, this one is actually wrong. If this one, if, if we don't have, or if, if can spawn, if can spawn flag, or in this case, we need to say if we not can spawn a flag, then we just return here so we don't go further in the code and just stop at this particular point. We're going to go here. I'm going to select the first, let's say, two or three. Not quite sure. At least, but, but at least the two. I want to make sure that this one cannot, as you can see, cannot spawn a flag. Also, I want to make sure that when I am inside the tile that this can spawn flag is actually false. So this one here is uh, actually true in the tile. It has to be true in, in this uh, prefab. So every new one is going to create one. Every other one is going to not create one. So these two can create flags. These two should not. Let's see if that works. Pretty good. So, and now we are able to, to navigate through. Awesome. So, last but not least, let's go with the flags. So, we can literally finalize uh, this uh, live stream over here. We want to make it so for the feelers, that the feelers are able to... Mm, tell it's it's object or maybe yeah we're gonna delete or de deactivate them something like that uh, we don't need to delete them but we're gonna deactivate all the corresponding feeler objects and for doing so there are pos yeah some possibilities to do that we can say every feeler knows its parent and itself or we can say it knows its opposite side and itself like um, we're gonna we're gonna put them together in one script but the feeler they need to have like an on trigger enter on collision enter something like that uh, on collision is bad but on trigger enter so if triggered the game manager needs to know hey you get some a score a point or whatever or um, like you get a 10 points when you pass by a green area except uh, maybe some specials uh, you can implement later on here as well so, in that case, we create a new c -sharp script, call this one feeler or flags, or flag. Now, basically, it's about feeler. Let's name it feeler. You can name it whatever you please. And double-click to open in Mono Develop Visual Studio. So, um, we don't need anything here, but what we need is we need to know who is our partner. Um, sometimes we got two, or probably more, so we maybe want to create an array or a list of partners, but it has to be public. We can also say, yeah, that's what we should do. Uh, we, we name it, uh, actually it's a type game object. And we give it a uh, named partners, partner feeler. So all the partner feeler need to be deactivated as well as the feeler itself. And of course, we're going to make it an array. So we can loop through all the partner feelers if you have multiple. So on. Uh, what we want to do is we want to define, is that a bad area? Is it a good area? What is would be the possible score or coins to get something like this? So public, public score. Uh, it's going to be let's let's make it an, an integer score to get. So if it is zero, we don't get score. If it is twenty, we get twenty. Also, what we want to do is we want to. Um, what else do we need? I don't know. I forgot. Anyway, um, what we need to do is void on trigger enter. So whenever we enter the trigger, 
we want to see who is passing us. To use on trigger enter correctly, we need to pass in a collider or a collision, one or the other. So what we want to do is if cul dot compare tag, we can now compare with a tag. And if that tag is going to be a feeler tag, ah uh, no, the player actually. If that is the player tag, so the feeler feels the player, not vice versa. Then we want to see. Oh yeah, we need to have a boolean, maybe. We can also use score directly. So if the score is zero, then we know it's a negative one or a bad, a bad feeler. And if it is a positive one, then we probably have a score. Or we can say, uh, give ourselves an option that this one is a bad feeler and this one is not a bad feeler, something like that. So depending on our decision over here, let me create a public boolean for this. Public bool. It's not needed, but but maybe easier is good feeler. So if that is true, then we get points, otherwise we don't. But once again, we can also use the score directly. So in that case, what we want to do is um, we want to get score. We want to send the score to the game manager, something like that. So in here, we're going to have a int score. We can uh, say something like public void add score. We're going to have an incoming score, so we say int amount. And now we can say score plus equal the amount we are passing in as an argument. In feeler, we can now say first of if it is a good feeler, um, let me do a life here as well, int lives is equal to, we are starting with 3 for example. We can do the same thing, but adding or reducing like lose life or remove life, remove life. We don't need an amount, but what we can say here, we can say lives minus minus so we reduce lives by one we could also type in minus equal one it's the same as minus minus and then we can do something like a lives check here life check that just means something like hey you don't have lives left uh, game over but whatever so literally it's a check like if lives if lives is equal to zero no typos then we can put a debug line here, debug.log, and then we say something like game over. And then you can get score, coins, whatever, bring yourself into another scene and so on. In feeler, we can now say, um, probably I get rid of this boolean option. Now we can say if score is bigger than zero, and we know we get score, and we, we touched uh, a good feeler, literally. If score is bigger than that, we got a, a good feeler. That means we want to report that good feeler thing, the score we get. What's happening here? What we want to report that to the game manager. So we say game manager dot instance dot add score. We want to add the score which is representing this one specific feeler. And now we want to deactivate, deactivate all feeler on this object. Um, like all partner feeler we have um, are connected to this. So in that case we want a loops row with a for loop. We can also, or we should be able to, since it's not a changeable list, we can also use for each. Sometimes people don't like for loop, sometimes they don't get it, sometimes it's easier to read. For each might be a bit slower than a for loop, but yeah. So for each item in partner feeler, we want to set this one to be deactivated. We want to deactivate this feelers. So we say uh, item dot set active 
to be false. You can rename item if you want to. So instead of calling it item here, you can also name it feeler or whatever. Now we save. And if that is not the case, if, if the score is not bigger than zero, we just want to lose a life. So we can tell over here, it's a bad feeler. I'm going to copy this part. Actually, this is double trouble. We could get uh, rid of all of these because there will be plus score, minus score, and we always want to whenever we uh, hit a hit a player, then we always want to go and deactivate all the content. But in here, we want to lose a life. Uh, remove life because we uh, we ran into a bad feeler or negative or whatever. Don't forget to save. And that could be, should be, would be it. Now let's go into our actual prefabs for the flags since they need to be set up correctly. So let's start with the last flag. Each of these feelers need to have the script of the, of the feeler. So I'm going to put it onto both of them, left and right. The flag does not care about it. So the positive feeler needs to have the negative feeler in its list. And the negative feeler needs to have the positive feeler in its partner list. So maybe there's a better way to do this. So this Negative feeler has the positive feeler, the positive feeler has the negative feeler, and the gate later on has two of them every time in the list. There's one more thing I forgot in the script inside the feeler is we need to deactivate ourselves afterwards as well. So, like whenever we do collide with something, like at the very end, we need to say game object dot set active to be false as well. So after we have deactivated all the partners, we want to deactivate ourselves. So the positive feeler can get a score, for example, 10. The negative feeler just stays at zero. Let's take the right flag and do the same. So we take the positive and the negative feeler. We put the feeler script on them. Now we go to the positive feeler and put the negative feeler inside its partner list. And we're going to put in a, a score of 10. The negative feeler needs to have the positive feeler in its list, but we don't add any score. And the last one is the ghost roof flag thing. And here we need to go and use all the feelers. One, two, three. Put the script on it first. Let's start with the positive. The positive needs both negative feelers to be deactivated. And we want to give it like a 20 points. Then the negative one needs to have the positive feeler as well as the negative feeler 2. And the negative feeler 2 needs to have the positive feeler 1, uh, uh, the positive feeler and the negative feeler 1, since that is number 2. Once again, there are probably better ways to do this, like using Raycast or something like that, something like uh, Bool visited, and then we don't score anything else, but then we need to connect all the objects um, to see who got actually triggered. That should be it. Now in Game Manager, when we go inside debug mode, we should see uh, the values about lives and stuff. If we are not on full play or full screen mode. And we should see, like when we go here, debug we should see stuff happening. For example, we should see if we get score. But as you can tell, I didn't got any score yet. Why is that? Because the player does not contain the player tag. 
So we need to put the player tag on the player and try again. So again, I select the but we don't get score and this could have uh, this could be because our um, actual flags or the flag colliders over here are not trigger colliders as well as uh, we don't have a rigid body component on it so first off I make the the feelers being trigger double click to open this box collider needs to be trigger and again, positive, negative, negative, box collider, be trigger. Also, our player needs to have a rigid body component to get notified. We could also do it vice versa, doesn't matter. But it's easier to have just one thing. So we type in rigid body. And add a rigid body, a 3D rigid body. We do not use gravity. We do not use a schematic or stuff. Uh, we just want to, we, we just need this one to understand what's going on. This one is a trigger here as well, by the way. If we now go with the, with the game manager, we now should get something. And now we got score. And also you're going to see that the objects, the, the, the colliders are going to be deactivated. There's one flaw. It seems that my character just slipped not quite sure why slipped inside the ground oh because the flags because the flags are uh bad um these these ones here they do not uh, one of them actually I guess it's this one we don't need any collision objects over here so I remove the collider on this flag this box collider here is not needed as well so I remove it you could also go and use them as or just select them and be as trigger or seen as trigger here same thing capsule collider remove component here same thing box collider remove component and last but not least we do the same here. Remove component. Remove component and here as well. All the colliders are not needed for them. Don't forget to save and try again. We can check game manager again for a value. So we should get 20 now. 10 here. 20 all of the child objects or all the, the colliders get deactivated once we pass through the correct ones. If we go to through a red, I gonna want us to see if we have no lives left. And if that is the case, we're gonna see a game over here on screen and then the game should be over. So pretty simple stuff. And yeah, this is basically everything I wanted to show in this one. So you can now put in uh, even more animations and stuff. You can uh, do obstacles um, to reduce even more life. You can do animations. You can make it as beautiful as you want. And you can spawn these tiles or on these tiles. You can spawn any obstacle you want to. You don't necessarily have to use flags. As an example, you can use, let's say you go on one of them tiles. And you're going to put something on to this. I get rid of the debug mode. It's a bit unclean. But you can put any, let's say a box or, uh, a, I don't know, a, let's say, a, a what is it called? A snowman. You can create a simple one. So, first off, you create an empty. Reset it. going to bring it back away just a bit. And you can name this one F2 to rename Snowman. And on here you can create a, a sphere. And you're gonna make it like like so. 
Um, so you have something to collide with. I set this one to be a trigger. Gonna control D. Gonna make this one a bit smaller. You can be as creative as you like. Again, if you're a 3D artist, this shouldn't be too troublesome for you to get something. And now we can use these literally as being a feeler. So this one would be a bad feeler over here. So you give it just a script here, feeler. And you can you don't have to you don't have to delete anything, but you can. So you could say, okay, I'm gonna delete everything. Um, like all the other spheres here as well. And the snowman would be, uh, I mean, it doesn't need to be, but you can reduce score or life or something like that by using the bottom sphere. You don't get score, but you lose life. And if you need more options, you can put a boolean over there and say, uh, I don't want to use the, uh, I don't want to uh, destroy this object, but you can probably spawn some gushy, uh, I don't know, some, some snow um, particle effects and stuff like that. So what you want to do is if you use something like a snowman, you want to put this into your uh, prefabs folder, uh, go into tile and give the tile the possibility to spawn a snowman like that. So it's not necessarily has to be only, it doesn't have to be only uh, a flag to be in the list. So let's see if we find a snowman. Oh, I forgot to delete the one from the scene. Maybe it should be a bigger, a bigger snowman so we can see it easier. There's one snowman. So yeah, and that's basically everything you need to know about endless running games. It's just a moving background using uh, some planes which are automatically created. You can fill even more content on two random positions. You can even say uh, you have like five different positions and uh, you're gonna pick automatically or the game is going to pick one of them spawn points or probably two and create uh, this way multiple um, possibilities for spawning things on top of one of these tiles. So this is totally up to you. You can pick from a list, from an array, since they don't really or probably don't really um, do anything else. And if you want to make it even more beautiful, you can even put something on the sides of the tile. I mean, we don't really see stuff over here, but you can uh, expect, okay, if there are people standing on the side, as I uh, have shown in the preview, let's say. I can take the snowman and bring this onto the side if I want to, or can can put on trees here on the sides. So each tile has probably a different set of trees on the sides to make it even more uh, beautiful, the game a, a bit more beautiful, and so on and so forth. But yeah, that's basically everything I wanted to show and discover. So whenever you want to create a new uh, type of endless runner just think about this is uh, this endless runner probably is not about ski driving over here maybe it's a snowboarder maybe it's a buggy maybe it's a truck maybe it's whatever maybe it's something else but but uh, being a ski uh, guy over here by the way after you have passed let's say five to ten uh, flags or something you might want to take a look into uh, speeding up the tiles. So that could be a little a little something you could try to figure out over, over here. So yeah, if you enjoyed this video streams, there were two in total. Feel free to, well, sum this videos up as you like and please, or if you like and please, as well as leave any comments down below in the uh, yeah, comment section. And if you want to see more content, maybe you have an idea, something you want me to discover in one of them live streams, um, let me know. Give me uh, something you want to probably see in the future. Have a good one. Enjoy your day. And we talk maybe next time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.